classes. All right, so the first Torah portion, as I said, is uh, Vekalach. It means, and he went. It's uh, chapter 31, De uh, Devarim chapter 31. And this is Moshe um, sort of just wrapping things up. And he's going to, he's only got a few days or hours left to live, and he's going to go to sleep. And, and uh, you know, if you have to die, this is a really pretty good way to do it. <laughs> I mean, he knows what's going on. He's completely lucid. He is completely accepts the situation there. He's lived a long life. He lived 120 years, uh, a long time, and his mind is as sharp as it was um, at the very beginning. So he's, he's, uh, he's got a pretty good situation other than he's not going into the promised land. So Yahweh is taking him up to Mount Nebo. It's basically on the, the uh, east side of the Jordan River and he's going to look over and Yahweh is going to show him the, uh, the entire promised land, the entire land of, of Israel all the way to the sea. Um, you know, I was over there and even as close to the Jordan River, and there's, I couldn't see the sea from there. <laughs> well, I couldn't see the, the, the Mediterranean from there. And it says in here that, that Moshe could see the Western Sea and all the way down to Beersheba. And so obviously Yahweh, you know, supernaturally enhanced his vision and allowed him to be able to see the land, which... Uh, you know, it was a pretty good thing. You know, it's a great reward that he had, um, although he didn't, what? Mm, even if it was, that's quite a long, quite a long ways. I mean, you got to really have good vision to be able to see. I think that's something in the neighborhood of about 60 miles, you know, uh, from the Jordan to the sea. So um, it's... Yeah, right, <laughs> right, yeah. So anyway, that's that's what's going on in in um, in uh, chapter thirty-one. Uh, Moshe went and and he spoke to uh, spoke these words to all of Israel, and he says, "Okay, this is it. I'm I'm gonna die now, and uh, I'm uh, Yahweh told me I'm not passing over the Yard Yarden, and and so the the big part of thirty-one here is Moshe is passing on his authority and his anointing to um, Yahshua. And, you know, we've mentioned this a lot of times before. Uh, Moshe sort of represents as a physical sort of impersonation or uh, personification, should I say, of the Torah, of the law. So he was not able to take uh, Israel over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. It took a man named Yahshua to be able to take Israel into the promised land. And so that's um, what's happening here is, uh, is uh, and, and of course, Yahshua is, uh, is uh, a guy that has been with, uh, with Moshe since really the very beginning, since as they came out of Egypt. He was one of the only, uh, one of the two spies that, uh, that uh, he's the son of Nun uh, of the tribe of uh, of uh, of uh, Ephraim that was able to uh, you know bring uh, one of the two spies as they spied out the land. He was one of the two spies that gave a good report and an honest report and said we can we can overtake these these people. We can we can be uh, successful. He he and uh, Caleb. Uh, of the tribe of Judah. So we got Judah and Ephraim again uh, being the two leaders uh, and the two good reports. They were the only two out of that original two million people or so that left uh, that left uh, it, Egypt that were over 20 years old that ended up going into the promised land. Everybody else that was more than 20 years old when they left the promised land, all of them died in the wilderness. These are the only two that went went over Caleb and Yahshua. 
Yahshua, the son of Nun. And I'm saying Yahshua, you know, your scriptures will say Yahoshua. Um, the English Bible will say Joshua. But if you look in, in, in the Hebrew, um, you know, in the Tanakh, it, Yahshua is spelled yod Hey wav ayin shin so, I mean, shit. Uh, so it's exactly the same uh, spelling that we have for Yahshua in the New Testament, exactly the same. So um, we would call him Yahshua. Which means, of course, Yahweh is salvation. Uh, so in, in verse 9, it's recorded here, uh, Moshe writes down uh, the Torah, the um, Torah, you know, and, and we know that um, this was given hit to him directly from Yahweh. Um, this is Yahweh inspired, Yahweh breathed, and uh, and he is uh, uh, has this written down in written form, and is given to the priests. Um, this book, this book of Deuteronomy, which is a basically a summarization of the Torah, is placed in. A copy of that is placed in, or the original is placed in the Ark of the Covenant uh, and is carried around. And he also commands that um, this book, this Deuteronomy, or Devarim, the words, a summary of the Torah, is read every seven years at Sukkot. Okay, so it's read during the year of release. We've got a couple more years to go before that's done, but it's still a, a great idea to read portions of Devarim at the feast at Sukkot. But the command is to read the entire thing during Sukkot on the seventh year. So in verse 14, he says, uh, my days are drawing near. He calls Yahshua and, uh, and uh, presents himself at the tent of appointment or at, at the uh, tabernacle. Uh, Yash, Yahweh appears in a cloud or, you know, the preexistent Yahshua appears in the cloud and the column and stood there and in verse 16 he says uh, to Moshe you're going to sleep with your fathers and uh, and uh, basically the the uh, uh, the authority then is passed on to uh, to Yahshua to uh, take the uh, uh, take Israel into the promised land so and we get to verse 22 there and uh, Moshe is, is, is basically presenting this song that we're going to see in verse 32 of, to the children of Israel. And, uh, and he commands Yahshua to be strong and courageous, bring them into the land. And, uh, and he commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant, take the book of the Torah, place it inside the Ark. And, uh, and he also again predicts their eventual and actually not too far off rebellion and uh, and uh, Moshe basically uh, d his last thing he does then is, is uh, as he gives this song so I'd like to read chapter 32 and we're going to go into a little bit of detail about chapter 32 and, and how this really relates to our walk and how we uh, can see in the, old, the New Testament how that's supported uh, in the writings of the New Testament that the writers of the New Testament or the new writings are going to draw from this and uh, and these uh, these concepts are, are, are very important. So uh, verse 32 um, or chapter 32 reads and it's it's not very long but it's he says give ear O heavens and let me speak and hear O earth the words of my mouth let my instruction fall as rain my speech drop down as dew and fine rain on the tender plants, as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our Elohim, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are right ruling, an El of truth and without right unrighteousness. Righteous and straight is he, a twisted and crooked generation has corrupted himself. Their blemish, they are not his children. Do you do this to Yahweh, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought you, who created and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and let him show you, your elders, and let them say to you, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of Adam. 
He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the portion of Yahweh is his people. Yaakov has allotted inheritance. He found him in a wilderness and in a wasted howling desert. He encompassed him. He made him understand. He watched over him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up his nest, flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, bearing them on its wings. Yahweh alone led them, and there was no strange mighty one with them. He made him ride in the heights of the earth, and he ate the fruits of the fields. He made him to draw honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle and milk from the flock, with the fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the choicest wheat. You drank wine, the blood of the grapes, but Yeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and you grew thick. You are covered with fat. So he forsook Eloah, who made him, and scorned the rock of his deliverance. They moved him to jealousy with foreign matters. With abominations they provoked him. They slaughtered to demons, not Eloah, mighty ones they did not know. New ones who came lately, which your fathers did not fear. You neglected the rock who brought you forth and forgot the El who fathered you. And Yahweh saw and despised because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, Let me hide my face from them. Let me see what their end is, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom there is no trusting. They made me jealous by what is not El. They provoked me with their worthless matters. But I make them jealous by those who are no people. I provoke them with a foolish nation. For a fire was kindled in my wrath and burns to the bottom of Sheol and consumes the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundation of mountains. I gather evils upon them. I use up my arrows upon them, wasted by scarcity of food and consumed by heat and bitter destruction. And the teeth of beasts I sent upon them. With the poison of serpents of the dust, the sword bereaves them from the outside and fear from within, both young men and maiden, nursing child with the man of gray hairs. And I said, I should blow them away. I should make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. If I did not fear the enemy's taunt, let their, lest their adversaries misunderstand, lest they say, Our hand is high, and Yahweh has not done all this. For they are a nation lost to counsel, and there is no understanding in him, in them. If they are wise, they would understand this. They would consider their latter end. How would one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and Yahweh had given them up? For their rock is not like our rock, and even our enemies are judges. Their vine is the vine of Saddam, and the fields of Amorah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is a per poison of serpents, and their ve fierce venom of cobra. Is it not stored up within me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine, and repayment at the time that their foot slips. For near is the day of their calamity, and matters prepared are hastening to them. For Yahweh rightly rules his people and has compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and no one is remaining, shut up or at large, he shall say, Where are their mighty ones, their, the rock in whom they sought refuge? Who ate the fat of their slaughterings and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them arise and help you. Let it be for a hiding place for you. See now that I, I am he, and there is no Elohim besides me, I put to death and I make alive. I have wounded and I heal, and from my hand no one delivers. For I lift up my hand to the heavens, and I shall say, As I live, if I have sh uh, sharpened my flashing sword, and my hand takes hold on judgment, I shall return vengeance to my enemies, and repay those who hate me. I make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword devours flesh. With the blood of the slain and the captives, from the long-haired enemy chiefs, O nations, acclaim his people. He avenges the blood of his servants and returns vengeance to his adversaries and shall pardon his land, his people. Then Moshe came with Hoshea the son of Nun, or Yahshua the son of Nun, and spoke all these words of his song in the hearing of people. 
And Moshe ended speaking all these words to Israel, and he said to them, Set your heart on all the words which I warn you today, so as to guard, as command your children to guard to do all the words of this Torah. For it is not a worthless word for you, because it is your life, and by this word you prolong your days on the soil which you pass over the yard and do possess. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe that same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Avarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, which is opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I shall give you and the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend and be gathered to your people, as Aharon your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. Because you, trans you trespassed against me in the midst of the children of Israel, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Sin, because you did not set me apart in the midst of the children of Israel. For you are to look at the land before you, but not enter there into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay. What? Yeah. All right. So this song of Moses, this was um, sort of his last, uh, his last, dissertation or last speech that he gave to uh, Israel and uh, we find that also in uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 15 so let's just go there and take a look at what that says And look at 1 through 3 here. We're going to say, uh, And I saw a sign in the heavens, great and marvelous, seven messengers having the last seven plagues. If you remember, we talked about this on, on Yom Turora, the seven trumpets. Remember, there were seven angels with seven trumpets. The last messenger, the last trumpet, had also seven bowls with them, right? Seven plagues or bowls. That's the one he's talking about here having the last seven plagues, for the wrath of Elohim was ended in them. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those overcoming the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding the harps of Elohim. So who are these guys? Who are these people standing on the sea of glass? These are people redeemed from the earth. And uh, these are, are saints. And they sing the song of Moshe. So that same song that we we saw here in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy here, uh, chapter 32, we're going to see at the end of the age, sing the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Yahweh El Shaddai, or Yahweh uh, El Almighty. Uh, righteous and true are your ways, O sovereign of the set-apart ones. Who shall not fear you, O Yahweh, and esteem your name, because you alone are kind, because all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your righteousness have been made manifest. So that's kind of summarizing what the Song of Moshe is really all about. Remember, we, we had seen here, and we're going to point out a couple of these things along the way as we, we kind of take this apart, um, the Song of Moshe. We also see in, in verse 2 here, we see Yahweh's word uh, compared to rain, basically coming down and raining on everybody all over the world. Uh, he says, let my instruction fall like rain, my speech drop as down as dew, as fine rain on the tender plant, and showers the grass. Um, we see in Acts 14, a, a reference to that. In Acts, uh, this is um, Shaul here talking, or the words of Shaul that are recorded here. In uh, chapter 14, he also uses the same metaphor here in saying, and uh, yeah, we're going to look at uh, chap. we're going to look at basically starting at 14, but a little bit um, further up here, just to get some context of what, what's going on there is, um, is uh, Shaul is in Lystra, 
and he's there, um, you know, preaching and, and teaching to people, and, uh, you know, he heal, heals a guy uh, that was uh, crippled, uh, and, uh, and what happens is the people try to worship him, right? And they say, oh, this guy is... Uh, is uh, Hermes and uh, Zeus and and um, you know he's there with Barnabas. What? Yep, twelve, verse twelve. Nope, verse chapter fourteen. We're in fourteen. I'm just giving you some context here of what fourteen's about before we get into what Paul says. Okay, so he's saying, you know, these people who he's preaching to, he saw that they saw this this. Uh, miracle of him healing this guy that's been crippled from the you know his birth and uh they barnabas is with him and they call barnabas zeus and paul hermes and he was the chief speaker and uh these are all pagans you know these are all pagan worshipers that worship pagan god's and he's saying no don't do that and here's where he, he, he what's recorded here is why this is important when the emissaries, Barnabas and Shaul, heard this, they tore their garments and ran among the crowd, saying, we're in verse 15 now, and saying, men, why are you doing this? We are also men with the same nature as you, bringing the good news to you to turn from these worthless matters to the living Elohim, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in that, sort of what's talking about in, in, uh, in the Song of Moshe, who in past generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Though, indeed, he did not leave himself without witnesses. That's us, you know, all of the saints throughout the, all the ages, doing good, giving us rain from heaven. Again, this Yahweh's word coming down from heaven, you know, being spread among the nations. And, uh, and that's an important thing for us to, to keep in, in mind. Um, I think it's Psalm 146 here that I want to go to for a second. Uh, Psalm 146. I don't have this in my notes, but I, I just want to point out one. Uh, No, that's not it. Maybe it's Acts 17. Somebody's phone is beeping. Oh, they're calling back in. Sorry. Are you guys still there? Yeah. Okay. All right. It sounded like there was. Okay. Sorry. All right. 17. Um, 30. Is that where I wanted to go? No. Anyway. Um, oh, it's Matthew 5, 45. And that's where I wanted to go. We talked about the that Yahweh... Uh, has the uh, uh, makes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So you know he gives he gives his word, and as you can see, we're going to see in, in Romans uh, a little bit more about how um, you know Yahweh has not hidden himself from uh, from mankind. If you go to Matthew five, I think it's forty five. Yeah. Matthew 5, 45. He makes the sun rise on the wicked and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So Yahweh's word is like rain and, uh, and does come down and, uh, and helps all of us. So uh, we can also see in, in, uh, in 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 16 and 17. Everybody knows this. They've heard this before. All scripture is breathed out by Elohim. Some, uh, some translations will say it's inspired, and that's really, it's Elohim or Yahweh breathed out, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, 
for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness. That's what Yahweh's word is for. That's what he gave us it for. And it's really available to everybody all over the earth. We see that this is, is, uh, is uh, you know, available to them. There's more Bibles now in circulation in virtually every language that's, you know, right there before everybody. But unfortunately, with their eyes being blinded, a lot of them just can't understand it. The rain is, yes, that's what uh, that uh, Moshe is describing Yahweh's word as rain, you know, and, and, uh, and we see that backed up in the New Testament. Um, James makes a mention of that, uh, Jacob, in, in chapter 5. Talking about waiting for the, uh, patiently waiting for the rain. Uh, brothers, be patient until the coming of the master. See, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You too be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the master. That's in uh, chapter 5 in Jacob or James, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Yeah. So... Um, you know, Moshe also mentions here, um, actually throughout this song, he makes many mentions here, but he first starts in verse 4 with uh, referring to this rock. Yeah, dirty, 32. You know, 32 is the whole song of Moshe. So in verse 4, he starts talking about the rock the rock and you know that's mentioned several times through throughout this um this song here uh and you know who is he referring to the rock and you know he's really referring to yashua who would come later but who was with them there you know as the pre-existent yashua speaking you know as the uh the uh <coughs> the spokesman or the, the word of Yahweh. Uh, we can also see that he also talks about that in verse 31 and, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's throughout here. But really, you know, where's, where's this coming from? Um, in the Haftorah uh, portion that we see in, in, uh, in this Torah portion, that's Second Samuel 22. And it's really the whole chapter, Second Sa uh, Samuel chapter 22. Um, David also does, records a song of his deliverance from Shaul. And if you go to Second Samuel, let's just go over there. In a lot of ways, this, uh, this song that David records here in Second Samuel... Shemuel Bet um, has a lot of similarities to Moshe's song. And one of them here is um, in verse uh, 2 and 3, he says, And he said, Yahweh is my rock and my stronghold and my deliverer. My Elohim is my rock. I take refuge in him. So I'd encourage you to read that whole chapter 22. That, that's the ha Haftorah portion that matches uh, Ha'azanu, Givir, Moshe's song, that uh, you, can, you can see a lot of similarities there. But let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Shaul kind of fills us in here and helps us understand that... Moshe kind of had an idea of, he, he, he knew something was going to come in the future. Remember he said there's going to be, Yahweh is going to send a prophet like me, you know, and he was talking about Yahshua. But he didn't really understand the, the, how that was going to work or, you know, what, when that was going to come about or, or what would happen. 
but he knew that deliverance would come from that that prophet like like him uh, and so we don't we don't really fill in or connect the dots until Shaul again points this out to us and helps us understand this now remember Shaul was taught personally by Yahshua for three years personally after Yahshua's resurrection you know he took Shaul into the desert in Arabia and taught him three years one-on-one -on -one. We got to believe Shaul had a pretty good understanding of what was going on after three years of intensive instruction. So when we get people that say, well, we can't really trust Paul because his writings don't match exactly what the, the Torah says, we got to understand Paul had more detail. He had more instruction. He had more revelation than what happened in, in Torah. He was building on Torah. Nothing Paul says contradicts Torah. We can say something like, you know, it's nothing new, it's just true. Okay, it's nothing new that Paul says, it's just true. More revelation, more, a little clearer picture than, you know, when we have a thousand years later. But still, we're still looking through a, a, a glass darkly. So let's go to chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians. So here, here's where Paul or Shaul, you know, lets us in on this revelation that he received from Yahshua. And he says, For I do not wish you to be ignorant, brothers, this is cha uh, verse 1, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were immersed into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea and all drank that same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed very clearly says that rock was Messiah very clearly tells us that Yahshua the pre-existent Yahshua the one the being that existed before he came to earth as a as a human being was the one there leading and guiding Israel in the cloud and the pillar of fire, brought them through the sea and provided them that spiritual drink from that rock that uh, brought them forth. Uh, So we get a little bit more of this in Matthew uh, chapter 16. Yahshua uh, describes himself here. Matthew chapter 16 as a rock. And here he's talking to Kepha or, or uh, Peter. Uh, his real name was Kepha. Shimon. And after rebuking him here, he says, uh, or before he actually rebukes him, um, he points out, we're just going to back up a little bit to like verse 13. Um, so he's, he's with his disciples, he's with his taught ones, Talmudin, and it, Yahshua comes, came into the parts of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi and asked his taught one, saying, Who do men say that the son of Adam is? He's asking him, you know, what have you heard? What, what? And they say, some say, Yochanan the Immerser. Others say, Eliyahu. Others say, Yerma, Yerma uh, Yahu, one of the prophets. And he said, now he says, now who do you, you guys, who do you say that I am? And Shimon, Kepha, answers and says, You are the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. And Yahshua responds and says, Blessed are you, Shimon, son of Jonah, son of Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Here's some more revelation that wasn't previously known, that was revealed by, by Yahweh. And so Yahshua continues and says to you, says that you are Kepha and on this rock I shall build my assembly 
and the gates of Sheol shall not overcome it. Okay, so this isn't, isn't quite clear when we read this in the English. Okay, because what is kepha is, you know, a Greek word. It means, or a Hebrew word, it means little stone, right? Little stone. The word that's 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 listed here in in uh, as uh, in verse 18 on this rock, that's Petrus, which means big stone. So he's talking about Peter. He says, Peter, you're going to be one of the leaders of this this assembly. You know, I'm building upon you, but we're building this upon me, the rock, the big stone, the big rock. And the gates of Sheol, or the grave, shall not overcome it. We can also go to First Peter. This is a whole big study in itself about Yahshua being a rock or a stone, a big stone. And, uh, and all the implications of that throughout Scripture, it's, it's, it's enormous. But we're just touching on it right now. First Peter 2 and verse 4. So he's talking about, again, about rocks and Yahshua being the chief rock, the chief one, and all of us together being built into a living temple, right? Here we are living stones, and we're starting in verse 4. Drawing near to him, talking about Yahshua, a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious. You are also as living stones being built up as a spiritual house. So all of us together being built up in a dwelling place for Yahweh, a set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yahshua Messiah. And then it continues on. It gives that reference in uh, uh, Peter then uh, you know, quotes Yeshayahu 28. We're talking about you see, there's a, a, in Zion a cornerstone the builders rejected. Um, and, uh, and he also quotes uh, Psalms 118. So there's a lot to, to understand about Yahshua as a rock. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. 118, verse 22. Yeah. So, you know, um, Moshe also talks about in chapter 32, he talks about uh, his people, uh, Israel, and later all the believers will ride upon the high places of the earth. And um, Shaul makes a reference to that in Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 4 through 7. We won't turn there, but it says... Um, if you, you just read the context there, he's talking about in verse 6, raises us up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Messiah Yahshua in order to show the coming ages the exceeding riches of his favor in kindness toward us in Messiah Yahshua. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, verses 4 to 7 is where I got that from. Um, <clears throat> we also talk about, you know, a good part of this, really from uh, you know, verse 15 to, I don't know, farther on. He talks about um, the people becoming spiritually fat. And it says Yeshurun, and that's another name. It's a sort of a euphemism for Israel, grew fat and kicked. And he's talking about in the future this would happen, and you grew fat and grew thick, and you're covered with fat. Basically what he's talking about is um, you have a lot of abundance, and you know, you're not really taking things very seriously. You're not really... Uh, uh, walking in the way that, uh, that I expect you to. And uh, they moved Yahweh to jealousy because 
of the abominations. They slaughtered to demons, basically. They, you know, took um, this uh, this tremendous opportunity they had and and went into uh, went into uh, worshiping other mighty ones. And we see this in in Revelation two. Um, it's actually ver chapter three, verse fourteen. So let's kind of go there, because this is an important thing about our walk that we really, really have to be um, careful of and constantly, I think, um, examining ourselves and making sure that we're not, we're not like this. Um, so he talks, he's, he starts out, and this is, this is the, the messenger uh, of the assembly in uh, Laodicea or Laodicea, uh, he says, "Write to this messenger." He says, "Amen." The trustworthy and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim, talking about Yahshua again, says this: "I know your works." This is Yahshua talking to that assembly. "I know your works that you're neither hot nor cold, and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You're just this lukewarm sort of." disgusting beverage that wasn't very appealing and he says why is that going to happen why because you say you say in your heart you say by how you behave by how you walk rich I am and I am made rich and need none at all and you do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked Okay, so, you know, he's talking about spiritual condition here. You know, he's talking about your spiritual condition. You're sort of saying in your heart, everything's fine. I got plenty to eat. I got a roof over my head. I got a good job. I got money coming in. Everything's great. You know, what, you know, we, we don't really have to work at this too hard. And, of course, Yahshua is saying, that's not acceptable. I, I'm just, I will not have that. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth for people that, that behave like that or, or think like that. What we really need to understand is, is what he's telling us, is that we are spiritually wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. We really have to, we really have to examine our walk um, and see how that applies to us. You know, see where, you know, we're poor and we're blind and we're not seeing the things that Yahweh is pointing out to us, the sin that's in our lives that we need to overcome um, and that we are really in a wretched and pitiable state by, on our own by ourselves. So he says to us, how do we fix this? How do, what, what can you do about it? Look in verse 18. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. And we've talked about this in several other, you know, teachings again. This is a, a common theme that we've been, you know, talking about this year. Gold refined in the fire. So what is that all about? Gold refined in the fire. It's gold, you know, the, the treasure that Yahweh has for us, the treasure in heaven. That's where our heart wants to be, it should be. And we buy that refined in the fire, refined through trials, refined through um, the things that Yahweh allows happen to, happen to us to teach us, to refine us, to be uh, ready for uh, you know for his uh, for his return, so that we can serve him. And uh, and he also says here, and white garments, so that you can become dressed. So the shame of your nakedness might not be shown. So what is what is the white garments? Okay, we know that from other places, where it says the 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 white linen, the the saints dressed in white linen, is the righteousness of the saints. Right. So that white linen, our our white garments, that's our garments of righteousness. That's basically how we walk, what we do. And anoint your eyes with ointment so that you may see. The ointment that we receive from Yahshua to be able to understand 
when we read something in scripture and we apply it to our lives and we see we can see clearly what he's telling us about our our spiritual condition and what we have to do to overcome and he says here and and of course this is repeated many other times in scripture as many times as many as i love i reprove and discipline so be ardent be zealous and repent so he wants us to be part of this group he wants us to be with him at the end but we can't take this we have to take this seriously we have to really make some some effort really make some changes in our lives to be ready for this because we don't want to be like you know those people that are say they're rich and have need of nothing we don't want to be spewing out of his mouth we don't want to be one of those goats like we read about in in uh, Matthew 25 today where you know we go what are you talking about we thought we were doing fine you know we weren't they weren't paying attention really their 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 focus was not on service their focus was not on on uh, on righteousness was it it was all about you know just go along you know take one day at a time everything's fine you know but we don't want to be like that we want to be people that are overcomers and people that are that are striving uh, again you know we talk about this every week striving to stay on this narrow path this narrow way Yahshua told us that few would find it it's not easy it's very difficult to stay on this path to stay focused and stay uh, moving forward um, also farther down here he talks about uh, in uh, we're back in Deuteronomy 32 again the song of Moshe he's talking about Yahweh's people talk turning to strange mighty ones or strange uh, you know uh, foreign uh, foreign uh, GODs um, and we see that of course all around us um, we've referenced this before uh, Romans chapter 1 you know there's a, a pretty long dissertation here about about uh, from our teacher Shaul about uh, worshiping the Creator rather than the uh, worshiping the creation rather than the Creator and so we're not going to go through and read that whole thing but I, I'd encourage you to go back and kind of review Romans chapter 1 again and uh, and just kind of focus on the last few verses there where uh, in chapter 1 uh, Shaul is talking about um, uh, same thing that happened to Israel same thing verse 24 and 25 therefore Elohim gave them up to their uncleanness of the lust in their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves these people changed the truth of Elohim into a falsehood and worshiped and served what was created rather than the creator who is blessed forever so you know this is just uh, an example of, of you know what happens when we take our eyes we take our mind off of Yahweh and we take we we take what's around us for granted um, we don't want to do that we want to be uh, focused on serving Yahweh and being as obedient as we can first um, John fa chapter 5 verse 21 um, Yochanan or the Apostle Yochanan um, closes his letter there and says little children keep yourself from idols you know he's not just talking about little statues of you know Jesus the glow-in-the-dark Jesus on your on your your dashboard you know he's not talking about that he's talking about things that we put in front of Yahweh these things that we put in front of him, either our, you know, our jobs or our spouse even, or just our children or, or money or anything ourselves, you know, or the pleasure that we seek for ourselves. You know, it's just, we, we really want to focus on the scriptures and we want to focus on walking in a way that's pleasing to Yahweh. Um, in verse 21 there in Deuteronomy chapter 20 or verse 21 he, he, he talks about uh, people being provoked to jealousy by the people of the nations 
Um, and that really can be true. And that's we see that. It, uh, let's look in Romans chapter 11. Paul talks about this when he's talking about, you know, the Jews of his time. What he was hoping was that these these uh, people that he considered brethren, he considered family, uh, Jews living in Israel, and and uh, that they would be provoked to jealousy and try to and change their lives, really, and follow Messiah. But we also we can see that sometimes among. Uh, people that we come in contact, sometimes people that aren't believers at all, that we can be like, really, uh, wow, that person, what an example. <laughs> I'm not doing anywhere near as good as that, and they're not even a believer. You know, so again, yeah, so um, that's, that's something for us to really kind of keep in mind. Romans chapter 11 and verse 11, he talks about... Uh, um, the falling away of Jews at that time, uh, uh, deliverance has come to the nations or to Gentiles to provoke those Jews to jealousy. Hopefully they'll change. They'll say, wait a minute. You know, we see people, these former pagan worshipers, you know, coming to be believers. And what's up with that? We, we really should change our lives too. So that was uh, what uh, Shaul was talking about. Um, we also um, see uh, I think I've got a lot more notes here than I have time for. We're almost at an hour. So um, Moshe also talks about Israel being lost and scattered. Um, Yahshua references that or makes uh, uh, a reference to that when he talks about that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel that were scattered all over the earth. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 24. Uh, Israel being lost among the Gentiles. Okay, um, first, uh, first Peter 2 talks about that, how um, we, uh, that the people that were called out among the Gentiles were called out who um, are a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Um, in verse 43 of, of Deuteronomy, back in the Song of Moshe, he's talking about Yahweh's vengeance um, against the wicked. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, we can see throughout Scripture that there... There is going to be a, a point in time where Yahweh will uh, pour out his wrath on the earth. And, uh, you know, he's not going to do that, though, until the entire earth has had, you know, tremendous warning. And even during that time and right before it, during that tribulation and, and uh, as those uh, last plagues are poured out, there will be... Uh, tremendous uh, witnesses, you know, we'll have the two witnesses in Jerusalem preaching for three and a half years. Unmistakable. The whole world will know about that. They'll have angels. There's actually three angels that will go throughout the earth proclaiming the, the good news. Uh, <clears throat> but you'll still have some people that won't repent as we see in, in, uh, in the scriptures. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 26 through 30, talking about sinning purposefully after you have received the truth. And this goes on to say, and, and he also quotes um, chapter 32, talks, quotes the, uh, at the end of this in, in verse 30, he quotes the song of Moshe saying, Vengeance is mine. I shall repay, says Yahweh, and, and Yahweh shall judge his people. So, <clears throat> you know, our, our, our motivation in, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, our motivation, of course, is not <clears throat> one to avoid punishment. Our motivation, of course, should be to pleasing Yahweh. But we also have to keep in mind that, <clears throat> If we 
you know, don't walk in this way. If we go off this path and go, there is a, there is a, uh, of course, a, a, a certainty of judgment, and uh, and <clears throat> we certainly don't want to fall upon that. We want to fall upon Yahweh's mercy, and uh, we want to be, uh, we want to be people who He is pleased with. So when Yahshua returns, you know, we can hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. <clears throat> so, just wrapping this up, we can see in, in the Moshe uh, giving this, this song of Moshe. Again, he taught this. He gave this song to the people of Israel as they were about to enter the Promised Land. And they uh, uh, were given this, uh, this, uh, this song to remind them of what had happened, what was going to happen, how they could avoid uh, bad things happening, how they could uh, expect good things to happen to them. And we want to, you know, keep this in mind. We're going to remember, we'll sing this song with uh, other resurrected, uh, <coughs> other resurrected uh, people uh, before Yahweh's throne. And we're very much looking forward to that. So, I hope this has been a blessing to you.